from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Award for Program of the Year and the Award for Best Educational Program. I'm the host and producer, John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is an educational support program for intermediate English learners. It's a program for people from all language backgrounds. Ramping Up Your English is also for people of all ages. If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. See, we take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Animals. This is segment one of episode 63. In our last episode, we saw how some information when researching an animal's life cycle, including the fascination, the fascinating life cycle of salmon. Now, it's a cycle that has very distinct stages, beginning with eggs, changing from a freshwater fish to a saltwater fish, and ending with a spawning migration, resulting in eggs for a new generation and the death of the mature salmon. In the world of mammals, many offspring soon grow to be smaller copies of their parents long before they reach maturity. Many mammals are noted for careful and lengthy care of their offspring. This footage is interesting. One cub stays closest to the mom while the other two lag behind. Now watch how this goes. The mama bear waits for the brood to catch up, but she's leading them somewhere, so she sets out again. And that closest cub decides to group with its siblings and the separation ensues. Now with this being the case, mama bear comes back to the cubs. It's evident that parenting, even in the animal world, requires a great deal of patience. Instruction is also a part of mammal upbringing. Now these two brown bear cubs are getting big in size, yet they depend on their mother to teach them how to get food. She leads them to a stream where they can watch her fish, thus learning the methods that secure the greatest amount of energy at the least cost in energy. Many animals pass on their learning to their offspring. This mother baboon is teaching an essential skill to her baby. These social animals use grooming to form bonds with each other. The importance of those bonds goes far beyond individuals. Such activities preserve harmony in the group. So the lesson begins early in life of the offspring. And with all the tension that goes with social grouping, this group harmony is vital to the survival of the group and its members. All across the earth, life cycles allow animals to continue their populations through countless generations, both in reproduction, protection, and sometimes teaching. So we spent the last three episodes on finding and reporting on an animal's life cycle. You may find this information in a Wikipedia, a website, or on a conservation group uh, website, or the Fish and Wildlife Service of the United States, or of your state in which you live. Also, some educational websites, the website of a zoo, Wild House, Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, Wildlife Park, the web of the America's National Wildlife Refuges, or a good old-fashioned encyclopedia, or a book on the animal you're researching. The information may be organized under headings like reproduction, breeding, mating, and or rearing. Now, our last episode contains some sentence frames you can use to tie these interesting facts together. As with all parts of your animal report, be sure to give credit to the source of information that you're using and use quotation marks for those times when you use the source's direct words. And those should be few since you want to learn and practice the connecting words that communicate the facts you find. There's more to an animal report than the life cycle. Uh, we'll look into another area of research 
when we return. Organization that's doing big time restoration of forests and stream banks. Hello, I'm John Lex, producer of Adventures in Education. You're watching Ramping Up Your English, a way for intermediate level English learners to improve English skills. We take a content-based approach to improving English proficiency for those who are no longer at those beginning stages beginning to learn English. This is segment two of episode 63. Let's review the elements we want in a report you're writing on your chosen animal. Now we've already covered these elements in previous episodes, describing your animal, showing its classification, explaining where the animal's found, its range and distribution, describing the habitat it needs and the biomes where this habitat can be found. Now, we just did multiple episodes on life cycles. Today's episode will explore the diet of an animal. Now, we featured diet in our previous episode on African animals, but we have more to learn. We also want to include the subject's physical and behavior adaptations as well as its conservation status. So when we talk about an animal's diet, we want to include what the animal eats. However, we want to go beyond that information to where the animal stands in the trophic world. In other words, the role it has in the food chain and in a similar concept called food webs. We want to learn how the animal gets its food and what it does with its food once it gets it. So that's what we're gonna explore in this episode. The concept of food chain has been around a long time. In English, the word chain means a linear structure that consists of links, usually oval in shape, that connect one to another link. You may have seen a small chain worn as jewelry, like a gold or silver chain, and if any link breaks in that chain, it no longer stays around the neck. Now, a food chain works the same way. Each link must be connected in order for the chain to work. The fundamental source of life energy in a traditional food chain is solar energy, which is produced by the sun. Without this solar energy, there is no chance of life energy being passed around for things that live. Well, there is an exception that's been discovered during my generation, but that can be considered a small exception when speaking of life on Earth. So how do living things like you and me get energy from the sun? Well, we could lie out in the sunshine all day and still not get a single calorie of life energy. That's because we're not in the right place on the food chain. In order for solar energy to get captured for use by animals, we need something that can absorb that solar energy and turn it into life energy. Fortunately for us, we share this planet with plants. They can do what we're incapable of doing. They take in energy from the sunlight, turn it into energy that can be passed on to other living things. For this reason, plants are called producers. Now with every breath we take, we should be grateful for air, but we should also be grateful for producers. Without them, we could not receive the energy we need to live. And neither could all those animals we admire so much. So the next time you see a plant, thank it for your life. Now, like many animals on Earth, we can get the energy we need to live by eating plants. People don't need to eat meat from other animals at all. When you think of deer, elk, mountain goats, and many other animals, they have the same needs as we have. They can get their life energy from plants, so they're called consumers. They consume the life forms that collect the solar energy and convert it to life energy we need. Yet there are some animals that can't live on the energy produced by plants. The cheetah is a good example. It needs to eat another consumer to get its life energy that way. And most farm animals are consumers, getting their energy directly from plants. They are called primary consumers. They don't eat animals, they can't. Their bodies are designed to eat plants, and that's all they can eat. The mouse that eats the nuts you leave out is a primary consumer. Same for the moose that eats the plants 
in the streams. For primary consumers, the food chain is fairly short. But what about the cheetah and others that must get their life energy by eating other consumers? They have a place in the food chain as well. They're called secondary consumers. They eat primary consumers. It's not a choice for secondary consumers. They could no more live by eating plants than we could live by lying out in the sunshine. Now, so the secondary consumers have a longer food chain than the primary consumers or the producers. Now, what about animals that eat the animals that eat the primary consumers? Any idea what they're called? The answer is tertiary consumers. Their food chain is even longer. As we'll see, tertiary consumers are often found in an ocean environment. Now remember that life energy, the nutrition, comes from the food chain to the ultimate consumer. Now this animal would be described as at the top of the food chain. And since an animal would need to be a predator to be at the top of the food chain, it would also be described as an apex predator. Now, these names can help you report on the diet of your chosen subject, but there are some names to know as well. Now, remember the primary consumers, those that eat only plants? That animal that eats plants and their products, like seeds, leaves, and nectar, are called herbivores. If my report were on a deer or a moose, I would note that it's an herbivore. Now, you may be familiar with the word herb, a food derived from plants, and that can help you remember herbivore. What about those secondary and tertiary consumers, those animals that must get their life energy from eating other animals? Well, we have a word for those as well. They're called carnivores, which means meat eaters. Cheetahs, lions, and wolves all are carnivores. What about animals like bears and chimpanzees? They have a diet consisting of plants and animals. Remember when I said that people can live on plants alone? Well, they can, but most want to eat meat. Animals that can live off plants and animals are called omnivores. They can eat anything and get nutrition from their food. Now, some animals eat only certain other animals. Those are carnivores, yes, but it's that animal that only eats insects is called an insectivore. Those are mostly birds. So there are some words that you can use to report on the diet of the animal you're researching. In fact, You've likely encountered these words in your source material. A certain question comes to mind. How do we know what an animal eats, especially if it's nocturnal or just shy? Well, one way scientists uh, research the diet of an animal is to collect its scat. So this is what scat is. So the scat is a substance that's excreted from the end of the animal's digestive system to jettison the undigested food. It's the animal's poop. Now, this is some scat I collected when hiking in southern Oregon near Ashland. It appears to be the scat of a coyote or perhaps some other carnivore. Now, how can I tell? Look at the fur in this scat as I pull it apart. A well-trained wildlife biologist would see not only the fur that we see in this scat, but would be able to better tell you what animal it is. Now, I am not a biologist, so I can only guess. So I found scat from animals I've never got to see on the trail. Some large scat told me that a bear was on the trail and that it was eating a lot of apples. Weasels leave their scat on a rock in the middle of the trail to announce their presence. Now, there seems to always be some fur or something fishy in their scat. When you collect scat, be sure to secure it in a plastic bag and wash your hands well when you get back home. Now, one of the best sources of learning about food chains is this book. It's called Quien Come Que. Now, that's Spanish for who eats what. Although I don't have an English version of this book, it's well enough illustrated that it can be understood in any language. Now, the cover has a clear illustration of an ocean food chain with a tiny fish eating a plant, a larger fish eating the tiny fish, and a shark eating the larger fish. Inside, a soup, uh, simple chain is illustrated from the leaf of a caterpillar to a wren to a falcon. 
The wren must eat many caterpillars to get enough nourishment to survive. The falcon must eat many wrens or other birds to survive. Each link in the chain passed the energy to the next consumer. In this case, the falcon is at the top of this food chain. The author reminds readers that most animals form parts of various food chains, eating more than one thing. The food chain seems like a simple thing at first, but in reality, many food chains interact with others. In the ocean, food chains get even longer. Here, the barracuda is at the top of the food chain by eating the tertiary consumer. Now, some plants in the ocean are so small they can only be seen when grouped together. These are known as plankton. There also are plankton in the ocean that are tiny animals known as zooplankton. These form the base of many ocean food chains. Now, food chains are a way of tracing the various things that animals eat. They demonstrate the importance of every link in the food chain. Another way of viewing how animals eat uh, depends on their each other in that independent way for their diet is the food web. It's more complex than a food chain. However, it, in its complexity, it illustrates the reality of animal and plant communities. Now, notice how the food web demonstration has to do with the interdependence of life in the ocean. Also notice how the whole web reaches back to the tiny plants and animals that pass on nutrients to make their way all the way to the animals there. Those tiny plants are producers just like their counterparts on land. They capture energy from the sun and pass it on to the animals. These tiny plants are called phytoplankton. The tiny animals that feed on them are called zooplankton. Let's learn more about these tiny drifters. Let's look at tiny living things that form the base of the ocean food web. You would need a microscope to see live examples of these, but the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California makes it easy. The general name for these is plankton. They live by the millions in the ocean. This interactive display at the aquarium allows visitors to see these microscopic creatures on a large display screen. These look more like machines or monsters than plants and animals, but many of them resemble the first living things to emerge on Earth. Visitors can spin the display to see all sides of the objects. Can you guess what this object is? As an example of zooplankton, we know it's an animal, but at which stage of its life? How about this one? You won't see one of these without a microscope, yet you likely swam with them if you swam in the ocean. It's the larva of a type of worm. By itself, this creature doesn't provide much nutrition, but remember that these plankton exist in huge numbers out in the ocean. Take a look at this one and see if you can tell what it is. Does its shape remind you of something you've seen in nature? Keep your eyes on the top of the screen. You'll soon see the identity of this zooplankton. It's the larva of a snail. As we've seen, the larva stage of some animals have little resemblance to that animal in its adult stage. How about this one? I remember seeing one of these through a microscope in a biology class. It came from a local pond. Copepods are consumers. They eat phytoplankton. Many small animals eat copepods, making them secondary consumers. If copepods were removed from the ocean, it would have a devastating effect on numerous sea animals. It would have a major impact on the food web, affecting many animals further up the food chain. That's why it's important to protect all life. Learning about how animals get their energy to live 
is an important step in keeping the ecosystem in balance. This tiny crab larva will get much bigger if it survives. Here's another mystery. This is also a larva, but of what animal? As an adult, this barnacle will attach itself to another object, forming a shell and catching plankton to eat with its foot. We know that life on Earth first emerged in the ocean from life forms similar to some of these microscopic creatures. Starting with single-cell organisms, life slowly became more complex, eventually resulting in the animals we see today. Single cells cooperated with other single cells to form some of the strange-looking plankton we've seen today. Even as more complex life forms, plankton are essential to powering the great diversity of life we see in the oceans. Seen from all sides, we can learn to appreciate these fascinating organisms. You're watching Ramping Up Your English. This is segment three of episode 63. This book, Kin Kome K, is published by Scholastic Books as a textbook. It's written by Patricia Lauber and illustrated by Holly Keller. It's only available through the school market from Scholastic, but you may find it at your public library or used bookstore. I'll have the ISBN posted on my website. That's letscreate.org. This is another book about animal diets. It's entitled Dinner Time for Animals from National Geographic Books for Young Explorers. That's the series they have. It's written by Jane R. McCauley. Let's look at a variety of animals and how they get the food they need. Now here's an apex predator, a shark, with some company. Now while the smaller fish have a good sense to stay away from the shark's mouth, they provide the service of cleaning its tooth-like scales. They look forward to the scraps that escape while the shark eats its prey, while not being in danger of becoming the shark's meal. It's a cooperative feeding arrangement that works well for both of them. The food web works on land as well. You know, this American bison is eating grass, and if uh, this wet meadow is there, it's going to have a good time eating. The, the uh, bison is an herbivore, the primary consumer getting its life energy from the grass it grazes. Crows are omnivores, eating both plants and animals. Here, they're eating a hare. In this case, they didn't kill the hare. They're scavenging the, the hunt of another animal. They're actually acting here as decomposers, helping getting rid of the body matter of a dead animal. Now, this brown bear can be said to be scavenging. Its main prey, migrating salmon, haven't started their spawning migration yet, so the bear searches for anything it can eat. This large animal needs a lot of energy to live. Like many omnivores, it's flexible about what it will eat. It has to stay alive at least until the salmon start running. If it's there for the salmon run, it can then fatten up on this rich source of nutrition. This Cape buffalo is re-chewing its food, the food it already ate. Like other ungulates, it regurgitates the food it ate to be chewed and swallowed again and that's how it gets more nutrition from the plants. Elephants also have their primary consumers. They use their trunks to help them reach and pull out vegetation. As an animal this big, an elephant needs to eat a large amount of plant material to sustain itself. Most animals this large need a lot of water to digest that volume of food they eat, as well as to keep their bodies from overheating. Now, while water doesn't provide the same life energy that food does, it's nonetheless critical to staying alive. And as a carnivore, a hawk could never survive on plant matter. A hawk, at least a secondary consumer, hunting animals for it is its food. This carnivore is a large and powerful predator. It's a leopard. Like other secondary and tertiary consumers, leopards eat large meals of their prey and then go days without eating. And the same can be said of this pride of lions. They often hunt cooperatively and share the kill with other 
pride members. The male usually doesn't hunt, but he's the first to eat. Like most predators, this red fox spends most of its time searching for prey. Predators rely not only on their prey, they rely upon the entire system that produces life energy and passes it along the food chain. A rhinoceros is a dangerous animal, but not because of being a predator. It's not. It's an herbivore. It eats plants. It must eat a lot of plants to survive. The greatest danger to the rhino is people. Another large animal that eats plants is the elk. Now, although large, some animals can survive and thrive eating only plants. As a primary consumer, elk must spend most of their time eating. It's no different for a moose. They are even larger than an elk. Moose are able to live on plants that live in the water. I saw these moose in Rocky Mountain National Park. This moose is in Canada's Yukon Territory. A beaver swims in the foreground. The swans are midstream. And here comes the ducks from the left of your screen. So I hope this episode on animals diets doesn't make you too hungry. I want to thank my director, Denise Ross, and my talented and loyal crew, and I want to thank you, our viewers. All of you helped make this program an award winner. Join us next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash Rogue TV. Join us next time on RVTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.